Welcome to the KT Music Podcast. This is episode five. Today's guest is Kevin Folks or DJ Food, among other aliases. Want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm DJ Food, uh, otherwise known as Strictly Kev or Open Mind Design, or a few other things possibly as well that I've forgotten. <laughs> so you've been doing creative work for how long? As far as, you know, music or graphic design? Uh, professionally for 25 years at least, maybe Un more. Unprofessionally. Um, you know, I've been DJing since 85, non-professionally, probably professionally since about 94. So yeah, a good, good quarter of a century plus. Nice. Lots of experience. Yeah. So uh, as far as that front goes, go ahead and maybe list off some of the different aliases and, you know, different projects you've had your name as over these years okay so early 90s i uh i started a, an ambient club an ambient night called telepathic fish in london with a sort of group of friends i was living with and we were doing squat parties and we were doing like sunday afternoon ambient sessions where people lie down and chilled out after clubs right. so that was when i was just finishing student school you know like university graph, studying graphic design and we went under the name of open mind was the, the the crew that set that up and the party was called telepathic fish that's a long story but i won't go into it um and then i hooked up with ninja tune in 94 uh and kind of insinuated myself into both the role of designer under the name Open Mind and also the recording artist DJ Food project, which was then several people in the studio, not just one person. Right. So there's that. And then um, in recent years, I've done a thing called Further with a friend of mine, Pete Williams, which is like a sort of audio visual, trippy throwback to the 60s kind of projection clubs sort of scene um, with DJing and audio visual stuff thrown in as well. So there's, there's that too, but you know, <laughs> that's enough. Right. So, yeah, I mean, so many great things there. Uh, what would you say that one of the biggest parts of your life, as far as, you know, these different projects, what would you say one of the biggest ones you've done uh, would be? Well, there's really two. It's DJ Food and being part of DJ Food right. uh, from about 94 onwards up until the present day and, and also kind of taking over that mantle at about in about sort of 2001 solo. Yeah. Uh, that's been one of the major things and also designing as Open Mind for Ninja Tune and then other, other labels as well concurrently right. um, since around the same time. So they've, they always run parallel and I never really talked too much about the design side when I was doing the DJ food thing because I was kind of yeah. trying to get my foot in the door with that and I didn't want to kind of muddy the waters and it wasn't until about five or so years later that I even told anyone that I was designing as well in interviews. So, I mean, so, now people still don't know that I did right. a lot of stuff back in the 90s and noughties for their label, you know, like design the logo. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, so dang. What, what made you want to go into graphic design? Uh, I always drew as a kid. Uh, I was massively into comics. You know, I was a fairly decent drawer in school. And then I went to art college and I thought I was going to do that as, as a job. And I did. I just thought I was going to be an illustrator. And when I got into college, basically, they said that you're actually better at graphic design. So I switched to that and I realized I wanted to do graphic design for music because music was my other passion. I was I was a DJ. I was learning how to scratch and mix and stuff since I was 15. So, so uh, I see, we talked to it. We've actually, you know, Paul Nicholson, another graphic designer on here. There seems to be a, a nice common ground between graphic designers who are very uh, music oriented. What would you mm -hmm. say some of your biggest inspiration as far as like, I want, I, you know, I really want to go into graphic design for music. What would be some of the, you know, album covers or graphic designers? Um, well, when I was a kid, I was really into uh, ZTT, the label of Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Do you remember them? What was you know that? Them? ZTT, otherwise called Zang Tom Tom. It was I a very, so. very British label, very huh. intellectual, but they were producing these crazy pop records that got to number one sometimes. 
but the, but the sleeve design wasn't anything like um, it wasn't anything like your classic you know culture club wham Duran oh, Duran right. of the era where they would just have glossy pictures of the the singers on the cover really big in full color they would have pictures of old manuscripts and, and statues yeah. and and just weird stuff that didn't more relate abstract to it. So, yeah much more abstract and there was a lot of weird sleeve notes that didn't just print the lyrics they right. told little stories and stuff and the whole label the whole design of the label was really radical for the time but a bit like you know factory records is seen as quite radical now because it's very minimalist they didn't have new order on the cover of the pit of the sleeves it was kind of along the same lines as that but i wasn't really into the music of factory at that point so uh it didn't mean as much to me and i discovered that later so music so, became something more important to you as you got further into your life, um, no, or? music was always important. Music was pop important from when I was about 10. I was really into 10. pop music okay. from, from 10. From the off, music was one of my main things, and art was one of my main things. Right. It didn't really occur to me that I could have a career designing or making images for music until when I was in university later right. on. Um, kind of obvious, but you don't really see what's right in front of your face sometimes yeah. when you're young, you know? And I was, I was into hip hop massively and I was it, it, from the mid eighties, I was massively into hip hop and I was writing graffiti as well. So that was, nice. you know, that was a, another thing of the music and the art almost sort of running concurrently because I was actually into graffiti before I was into hip hop. I got into hip hop through graffiti because it was the music was associated with writing graffiti. Right. So um, when you say uh, writing graffiti, do you mean actual, like graffiti on the street or do you mean yeah. the Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was this, yeah was I mean, I started in a, in a pad and I was, you know, um, drawing and, and, and refining my style as it was. And then I started experimenting with spray cans and me and my friends would find old walls and, and derelict buildings and, nice. and stuff like that. And we would do pieces late at night and stuff. I never did trains or anything like that. Where I lived at the time, yeah. I wasn't living in the city. It wasn't, a, wasn't an option to do a train. And also we could never get the paint that would stick on a train. It would always run off, <laughs> you know, terrible, terrible paint back in the eighties. Right. So what was your childhood like? Did you, were your parents both creative not at all, really. Well, they were creating a different way. I mean, my dad's a mechanic and, okay. you know, he's okay. super, wow. super um, precision. He was all about precision. And do you know this word bodging? Do you know what yeah. bodge is? Yeah. It's if, if you like do something really quick and it's not very good, you know, right. he was all about don't bodge it, just right. do it properly. And he, he drummed that into me from a very, very early age. You know, it was huh. like, it was like the worst thing you could do to bodge a job. Yeah. You know? <laughs> And, uh, you know, and so, so the, there wasn't, the weird thing is there wasn't that much of culture in my house. My parents didn't have a record player. My dad was into cassettes and we used to mainly listen to the radio, you know, and it was local radio and it was pretty, pretty bad. Um, <laughs> but I used to listen to the late night hip hop shows on my headphones at night on the weekends because they had a, a station that I could pick up where I lived. I didn't live in, in London like I do now. And we could pick up a, a show called the Capital Rap Show with this guy, Mike Allen, who's since passed away. But um, in the mid 80s, he was, he was like the guy that you could hear new hip hop imports from the US on the radio in, in the UK. Um, wow. And this was before hip hop was big like it is now and, right. and on all the major stations. You know? yeah. It was almost like a little independent what, show. What were some of your favorite hip hop artists at that, in, around that time? All the Def Jam stuff, the, you know, literally the first Def Jam. We're talking oh, yeah. Jazzy J, Beastie Boys, LL Cool J. You know, this is before Public Enemy even. I loved Public Enemy. I loved, um, oh man, Mantronics. All so that you, sort you of must stuff. be a pretty big fan Kim, of uh, Rick Rubin. All, I, but not even, not, not even just that, you know, like um, there were all sorts of crazy little independent 12s that would crop up. We'd get two live crew or when we'd get Schooly D and we'd get, uh, you, know, you know, early Cash Money, Marvelous, Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, you know, literally the first records they ever put out. Right. We'd hear them on a Friday or Saturday night and take them on our tape decks and then go to school on Monday and be going, oh, do you hear this track on oh, the weekend? <laughs> you know, it's crazy. <laughs> you know, this, this crazy edit thing by the Latin rascals or something like that. 
uh, Marley, all the Marley Marl productions, really, really tough. Right. You know, early sampling, Jungle Brothers, De La Soul. Oh, yeah. What's, what's now termed the sort of golden era of hip hop, but right. um, was just what was coming out that was new at that point. You know? Yeah. Did you get to go to any of their shows? I went to tons of hip hop shows. They were, <laughs> yeah. you know, a lot of people came over here, especially once Run DMC blew up. So I, I saw Public Enemies' first tour, I saw Beastie Boys' first tour. I saw, uh, you know, all those guys, all the Def Jam, LL Cool J, Houdini, all the DJs, Cash Money, when he won the DMCs, he won it in London, he won the international thing. Oh, man, so many. Stets of Sonic, Just Dice, just, just, just everyone I could see. The only people I didn't see that I really wanted to see was maybe De La Soul. I just, for some reason, missed them every time. And, you know, when Three Feet Home Rising came out in 89, it was a huge record. Yeah. And uh, I just I just never got to a, a thing that they were at, which was kind of yeah. annoying. But I saw, yeah, Grandmaster Flash, Aquaman Barter, all these people <laughs> came over and, um, and, and, and played. And it was incredible. And, and you wouldn't get gigs like that now. Right now. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things I ask people who are, you know, more higher up in the music business, as you got more popular and made a name for yourself, were there some of the times where you met some of these people that you I, looked up to or really liked their music? Uh, you know, because obvi- you're associated with Ninja Tune and, you know, a lot of yeah. people. Oh, yeah, that. yeah, totally, yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of my biggest influences as a sort of DJ and someone that made me realize I could do, you know, the cut and paste thing, the DJ thing, were the guys Double D and Steinsky who made these mega mixes called The Lessons. And I... I met both of them and became really good friends with, with Steinsky especially and, you know, would hang out with him and we started even doing some music together at one point. But, um, yeah, I, I, I've, I, I wouldn't say, you know, I mean, I, I, I supported the Beastie Boys in the UK for one right. night in London in 98 when they did the Hello Nasty tour. And, you know, those guys are just, <laughs> they've been up there since the first record they ever put out for me. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't say I met them, but, you know, yeah, you run into all sorts of cool people. Um, right. You know, heroes from the past or just contemporaries, and virtually everybody is cool. You know, like all the Ninja Tune lot. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, you know they're so they're so good. Cold Cut, you know, Cold Cut were my heroes right. when I first yeah. met them. They're amazing. You know, I'd been buying Cold Cut records since their first record, and I'd even been buying early DJ Food records. You know, before I kind of jumped into that project. That's so, insane. And, you know, and they are, they, you know, I consider them really good friends still to this day. And, right. you know, but you don't really think about it after that. You know, yeah. you, you hang out with these guys, you tour with them, you know, Kid Koala, Amon Tobin, people like that. You know, they're just regular guys, <laughs> Were, you know, was, but yeah. Was there anyone that you met that was just kind of crazy? Because, I mean, I've heard some people who have met some, uh, not celebrities, but people like professional musicians and they're just like, that guy was nuts. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think. I, I, no, no one springs to mind. I or, have to say, there were a few people who were a little bit offish, you know. Who, right. who I guess you know, you kind of mean. wanted to just say hi, and they weren't really <laughs> in the mood or something. But right. you know, I guess I should say, um, was there anyone that you met that stood out? Like, even if it was a brief encounter, you just had that, and it was like, wow, that was crazy. Um, I did, um, well, I had this weird experience in Ireland where I played a gig one night and in, du- in Dublin yeah. and the guy who was the promoter was a really good friend of U2 and I was oh. playing at this club which U2 owned and he said to me, oh, U2 are here, you know that? And I'm like, no. And so he said, oh yeah, they're in the back room, they've got a little VIP thing. And so <laughs> I go, oh, cool. Okay, that's cool. Um, <laughs> didn't see them, didn't hear any more about it. And I'm getting the car with him the next day to the, uh, the airport. And his phone goes, and this is like, this is, this is sort of late 80s, uh, late, late 90s, sorry, and he's got a phone, you know, so he's doing pretty well. <laughs> yeah. And um, he goes, it's Bano for you. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I pick up the phone and it's supposedly Bono on the other end from you too. Oh, man. <laughs> and I'm like, hello, hello, how are you? And he's like, ah, it's Bono, Mr. Fooled. It's Bono. Um, <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> you know, I really liked what you did. I can't do an Irish accent at all. Um, I really liked what you did in the club last night. You know, you kept me away from my friends on the dance floor, which was probably for the best, you know. Uh, and I was like, oh, wow, you know, great. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. But so, so supposedly he was 
at the club dancing to my set. I never saw it. But I still don't know to this day whether that was really Bono <laughs> or whether that was just one of his mates just ringing it up for the crack because that's what the Irish are like, you know. They're like, yeah, yeah, my whole family bring, bring me on the way to the airport tomorrow. We'll pretend you're Bono. He won't know the difference, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. But that was weird. That. If, if it was Bono, you know, that was weird. Yeah, well, how, if we get if we ever get him on here, we'll ask him about that. Yeah. Did you ring DJ Food on the way to the airport back in the late 90s? <laughs> I'm sure, I, maybe he, he might remember that. He might. Yeah. But yeah, that's crazy. So, I mean, obviously, you know, just growing up, I listened to DJ Food probably more than a lot of the different music I listened to. Huge influence on me. Um, so do you keep in touch with the other people that are in the label? You know, currently, are you involved with anything ninja tune wise yeah i mean um i mean we just put out a reissue of kaleidoscope which was yeah you know, 20 years old 21 years old now actually um so pc and i patrick carpenter the other half of food who i was mainly producing with in the sort of late 90s yeah we got together and and went through a load of our archive stuff and cobbled together this well we didn't cobble together we we unearthed about two hours of music Wow. For that, and then realized we had actually quite a good sort of unreleased albums worth of yeah. stuff. Half of it I didn't even heard. He hadn't even played it to me before. Wow. But, um, you know, it was all from 20 years ago. And so, uh, you know, we we submitted that to the label, and they were like, cool, yeah, let's do this. You know, hasn't been a food record in some time, you know. And so, yeah, I speak to, you know, I speak to them when I have to. I don't do tons of work for them anymore. Right. Um, design wise but you know they would be the first person i would send a new record to for sure yeah you know a dj food record of course um and i see coca you know now and again i was staying up at matt black's house the, the other weekend and we were doing some music actually some non-dj food music we we, right. we got a sort of secret project underway that we're oh. bashing away at um <laughs> which is hopefully going to see the light day next year nice um, exciting you know, and John Moore from Cold Cut lives really near me. I see him. I'm doing a radio interview with him next week about sampling and, and pirate radio in the 80s. So, That's pretty cool. We'll have to be there. So, you know, yeah, we cross paths. I mean, the people I I see Herbalizer, Ollie from the Herbalizer lives really near me. Uh, I don't I don't see people like Amon and Kikoala too much because they live right. abroad and, you know. Um, but we, yeah, we always run into people. Funky Boccini, I saw literally two weekends ago. I uh, went to cool. a crazy performance that he was doing out in the countryside with lasers. <laughs> wow. You know, he Is still he, makes oh, music. That's you know, pretty sweet. You know, with the, the whole Ninja um, label in the 90s was very small and family like. And right. you get this with, with kind of new independent labels. Everyone knows everyone, everyone's kind of doing all this cool stuff for the first time and, and you have experiences together and you grow together creatively and, uh, and literally, and that there's lots of crossover. Everyone remixes everyone's stuff and supports one another on the road and stuff. And you really, you get a bond with someone which that you, you don't lose that because you, you may drift apart for a few years, but when right. you, 20 years down the line, you're going, Oh man, you know, remember that shit we did, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. it was yeah, crazy. It's still there. Yeah. That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, it definitely is. Definitely history, you know. So, I mean, obviously, a lot of the labels I look at, including Ninja Tune, I, I tend to see this, you know, with Warp, Ninja Tune, even, you heard of Ghostly International? Yeah. I, I see these labels and they get big and it, I feel like they get less personal, you know? Yeah. What do you th how do you feel about that? These labels as, you know, growth in that sense. Do you think it's better to be in a label when they're small and more person to person, like from an artist's point of view, like for example, me and Caden have been working well, they, on music. Huh? They have, they have their benefits and they have their, their, um, you know, their minuses, but yeah. uh, when, when it's small, it's cool. You right. can kind of, you can get on top of everything and you can do stuff and, but you're limited because you're limited by budgets. You're limited by what right. resources you have, distribution, manufacture, all that sort of stuff. When we, when we were doing Ninja in the nineties, and I was designing for them for a few years. I could only use one or two colors. I couldn't even use full color. <laughs> you know, I couldn't do any specials. I couldn't do any like varnishes or metallics or yeah. you couldn't do any wow. crazy, wow. Uh, you know, you know um, what were the uh, colors? packaging or anything like that. So I was really limited, but as the label grew and, you know, things got more stable, 
they could afford more to do, you know, with, with that. And and so it got better and better and the bigger, but the, but the, the reality of a label getting bigger is you have to employ more people. So right. your costs go up, all sorts of things go up. But, you know, someone like Ninja now, you know, they're a, they're a large independent. Yeah. And, but they're still independent and they can do things way, way quicker than majors, like big, right. you know, big major labels and things, you know, they're, they're able to sort of turn in the, in the stream way quicker than say like the whale, like, you know, they're a bit right. more like a shark or something like that. Yeah. Um, and they can turn and adapt to, to things. And, and the whole industry at the minute is having to adapt to not only environmental things, but the, I'm sure you're aware of the whole vinyl pressing, you know, sort of uh, problems that are happening in the minute. There's all sorts of, Cutbacks, delays, shortages, extra costs. Right. Shipping. Do you know why? Oh, there's a there's a multitude of reasons. Um, how long have you got? <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. Sure. The, main, the main one, the main one. Well, COVID has has basically put a lot of things out of whack because people were off. So, you know, release and um, schedule slipped, um, and it's and in certain countries are still slipping. Um, yeah. There's a huge PVC shortage apparently because some of the storms I really? think in Texas from last year um, wiped out a load of PVC production, which is used for the pellets, which are right. you know melted down to make the wax. There was also there's also um, there was a huge fire in the US at the plant that makes the material that makes the lacquer, which is the original master oh. plate for each record. That was a couple of years ago before COVID. There's only two plants in the world apparently that make that and one was in the US and it was the biggest one it's burned down Damn. another one's in Japan and they've got a shortage so wow, there's yeah. a number of things I mean in the UK at the moment we're waiting eight months for a record Holy if you smokes. put it in today oh it'll my come gosh maybe <laughs> you know so you can't really run a business like that so um, you know indies are, are more, a better serve to sort of respond to these little things and I've already seen more people start to manufacture CDs, start to yeah. do tapes, you know, just look for alternative ways to right. get their their products out there. You know, a major's probably not going to do a, ta a tape of the new Lord album. Maybe they are, I don't know. Right, they right. did something crazy like eight variants of the, of the album, you know. And that's another reason, <clears throat> because vinyl is back in a big way and everyone's buying it, the new generation's buying it. Right. Let major labels are doing variants. They're doing crazy numbers of variants on every release and of course they're pressing thousands of copies rather than hundreds so they're block booking the pressing plants and the pressing plants are letting yeah. them jump the queue in <laughs> some instances repeatedly so you've got a multitude of factors basically slowing things down you know Damn. and the independent labels that kept the pressing plants in business for for a good decade and a half before final came back are kind of push to the bottom of the pile unfortunately right. yeah well that sucks yeah well <laughs> man so i'm i'm curious what was it like to have a transition of power from you know you were a big part of the ninja tune label and now you've stepped away from that and i'm i want to know was it something that you had to build a separate team or was it something that was already there and sort of running itself and you just started to walk away from? No, no, no. It's uh, very different. I've always kind of worked for myself and I've always been freelance. So even when I say I work for Ninja Tune, right. I'm, I'm working at home in my studio. I yeah. don't yeah. go into the office and things like that. And, and I don't really have a team. It's me and whoever I'm collaborating with on a project that might sure. be another street or a photographer or, or, or anything really. Um, so like anything, um, you know, like the label growing and changing, it's gradual and you, it's barely perceptible. You know, yeah. Because yeah. It, it, and the label's 31 years old this year. So it's, Man, wow, you know, crazy. three decades now. And I was there from nearly the beginning and I've been on board ever since, you know, I'm still cool. signed yeah. to the label. I'm, you know, they can call me at any point. And, you know, they call me to do a lot of reissue stuff where I did the original art artwork and they don't have it. So, I, and I have it because yeah. I have a huge archive of work. And so they're like, we're repressing Alan Tobin. Yeah. We're repressing this and that. Yeah. Have you got so, the files? And of course I have. And, you know, I sort of rebuild all the artwork and stuff. So, um, you know, there's a good 20 years worth of work there. 
Um, right. And that's pretty good, you know. Yeah. And, but, but like anything, you know, things gradually shift over time and, and I wanted to do different things or I may be, you know, getting different projects or, or my life's going a different way. They're going a different way with, you know, musically and stuff. But, um, yeah. you know, the, things, things have a habit of kind of what, you know, going or branching off and then like coming back and right. you know it's I've been doing a lot of work as I said with Matt from Cold Cut recently and they've reactivated their ahead of our time label which was a little independent label that Cold Cut put their records out on before Ninja hmm. that's been reactivated as a side label basically for all their projects within that's Ninja so cool. it's like a sort of little secret weapon of sort of alternative <laughs> left field stuff because right. Ninja's quite commercial now you know it's, yeah. they've got some pretty big names you know the headlining festivals, some of these artists, it's a, it's a big operation, you know, right. and yeah. it's still independent, but it's a big independent, as I said, you know, and there's less right. room in that kind of environment to take big risks, you know, De- definitely. like, uh, uh, so- you know, some crazy little experimental, <laughs> you know, left field record or a piano album or something, <laughs> so- you know, but they put that stuff on ahead of our time and, and the other little sub labels like Big Dada and Technicolor and stuff like yeah. that. So about the recent Ninja Tune, actually, are there any of the uh, you know the newer artists that you are really like their output, like their music and stuff? Uh, little bits and pieces. I mean, Bicep are pretty good. Yeah, they're great. You know? um, what else is Bonobo just put a new thing out, but I haven't heard. Well, he's about to put something out, but I haven't heard it. Oh, um, <laughs> I can't think of too much stuff to be honest. Yeah, I'm, I'm more into the fringes anyway. That's another right. thing. Musically, I've kind of moved away from where they're moving, you yeah. know, and I've also moved away on design work to other other labels, more electronic-based stuff, yeah. you know. Um, have you so. found your interests evolve? I mean, like, have you found them, just like you were talking about things, branching away and coming back, have you found that same process with your interests? Like, I know you said you're in the fringes. But mm. has, I mean, working with DJ Food, you definitely, I'm sure you had to find a common ground with where the art, the integrity of your, your own vision had to be warped, but now it's yeah. changing. Yeah. Well, the common ground with DJ Food, when it was myself, Matt, John from Cold Cut and PC, Patrick, uh, was pretty much, the intersection was funk and hip hop. I think I said this yeah. before. Um you know, that was the sort of creative cross route, crossroads where we all got into it. But then on the fringes of there, there's African, there's reggae and dub, there was electronica, there was jazz, you know, but so sort of the turntablism of hip hop and the funk of funk, funk. you know, yeah. were the sort of staple foundations of, of the food sound, you know, yeah. from the sampling side to the, you know, the records that were being sampled. So, so um, and, and that's, that's an interesting thing as well, because Patrick, PC, you know, he was always more into the jazz side and then he yeah. he left food to, to be part of Cinematic Orchestra, which was like a live jazz band. And he was he was on stage with them basically performing with electronics and a turntable. I saw so he them. was bringing a sort of left field component yeah. to that. I, I saw them live at Field Day, I think two years ago. That was great. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. Right. I, I think that was I think that was them. Yeah, I, it must have been. But yeah, yeah that, they, it was a great show. So, yeah. so changing gears here a little bit, what's, you know, talking about your life nowadays, when was the last time you went out to a club or concert and what did you see? Oh, literally Saturday. Nice. <laughs> oh, nice. Which Very good. Like, it was the big, it was the first time I've probably been out to any kind of club and danced for I, well, two years probably. Um, oh, I did a record fair on Saturday in London, which was like a, a new record fair, like an esoteric thing. I had right. a stall and I was selling records. Yeah, you were selling yeah. CDs, right? And I was selling C- well, CDs and, and, and vinyl and, and bits I w- of weird. I was actually, uh, I was snooping around on your website. <laughs> Not snooping, but just, you know, browsing and I saw that. Yeah. It's all there, it's all public, you can look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I did this record fair with my friend Pete, who I do further with, and then... Um, and that was in the day. And then we all packed away, had some food. We came back. There was a pop quiz about music, which was really, really fun. Nice. And then they cleared away all the tables. It was in this really weird, do you know what a working man's club is? Do you have that kind of thing over there? Working man's club? Yeah, How would you describe it's that? Kind of, yeah. It's kind of like, um, it's 
It's got a bar in it with really cheap beer. Sadly, tables we're and actually... chairs and and there'll be a stage and there'll be some form of entertainment. And it will be a okay. place a bit like a pub where people would go in the old days yeah. to kind of That's probably all we have around here, work. actually, because we live in a really small town yeah. and the nearest club is in Detroit. Yeah. And okay. you know they're they're finally starting to you know become more like proper <laughs> yeah. clubs, but I, I will say in a brief tangent, America's club life, especially in this area, not very good. And if it is, really? like the only clubs you go to, you know, radio DJs, um, like pretty you know playing essentially Spotify and right. very, it's, very, it's, it's not the experience. Especially in Michigan, you go maybe the coast. There's one, one or two. Yeah, it's pretty. But sad. then right into the middle of Michigan, all farm. <laughs> yeah, mostly wow. hunt, how, okay. mostly country. Uh, there's, I mean, the only thing on the radio around here is other country music, Christian yeah. rock, or you know, repeats of pop music, like from the last yeah. ten years. So I mean, so <laughs> how do you? How do you? Have you got like a group of people that you found that are like what you're we call your it. tribe? You're looking at it pretty much. That, really that's how small been. the town is. It's well, we've we've definitely been the epicenter for. <laughs> I mean, like I think things music related gravitate around what yeah, like we're whole, bringing in. The whole town knows out. of us because we've put on like techno house concerts cool. in, in, in Ludington. And, you know, most people aren't used to anything other than country. So they'll go and they'll either have their mind expanded or they'll start yelling and leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One or the other. It will be, it will be a life changing experience or yeah. they'll never want to see it again. It, exactly. So do you foresee a time where I'm interviewing you now? Oh, wow. oh great! Well, so the time where you're going to have to move on, you're going to move out. You're going to have to go to a Death, city somewhere yeah. where you can actually, yeah. you know, further your oh, careers. We're probably that's uh, actually that I was am. that was something that we have both. Uh, I'm moving to Lansing. We both, yeah, he's moving year. to Lansing, and I'm I'm going to be uh, you know probably you know half a year a year late after him. So I, right. now, I mean, with the internet now, most of my I don't know ex- experience has been virtual i uh, like i think last year i did a like live i had like a some music in the reflex records live stream with yeah. some other guys and stuff but i mean it's just so hard when you're in a small zone when there's nothing even going on in the entire state to do anything yeah. in person but anyways en- enough about us let's move on yeah, yeah. back I'm, to you here you're i actually want to know i want to know <laughs> about funky eno more volts oh, right. Funky, you know, yeah, yeah that's mixed <laughs> How long ago was that? 10 20, plus years, maybe 2010, I think it was. Um, I've been a massive Eno fan for years, and there is some. I mean, a lot of people, when they think of Brian Eno, think of they think of ambient, right? Yeah, right. or, or um, uh, but I think of funk from you know his sort of late 70s, yeah, period. He's got another period. side to him, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> side where there's a bit of slap bass going on there's mm-hmm. some of his solo stuff some of the stuff he did with talking heads the my life oh, in the bush yeah. and ghost album yeah he does he does have a little bit of funk in my life definitely eclectic in the uh, yeah. bush of i can't remember what song that is but i i remember thinking there's there was just you know it was almost like that album was a, like a 12-sided die yeah, is what it oh, felt yeah. like. Yeah, Regiment is the classic track on that with the where, do, 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 do. yeah, oh yeah, we're sort of loping hip hop beats and stuff, and then you've got <laughs> this sort of really up tempo sort of samba over "Help Me Somebody" and stuff. Uh, <laughs> I love that record. It's just ah, uh, there's nothing like it. So anyway, I did this mix uh, ten years ago. I just thought everyone's doing ambient mixes of Brian. You know, I do something different. You know, and oh, yeah. You know, string all the funk together. There's a lot of. Oh. Them. So, I just I was thought here. You asking question. I, I, oh, I, I'm actually totally blanking. I remember the last time that we met. You yeah. recalled your encounter with Brian Eno. Do you think you could yes. share that one more time? Yes, I'll try and do a short version. I went to Eno Studio for a launch of something via a friend and on the way I went to a bookshop nearby in Notting Hill which is where the studio is and I found a pop annual from 1974 or 5 or something where there was a feature on Eno as a solo artist over a few pages so I thought I'll buy this it was very cheap put it in my bag go to Eno's studio we're we're talking during the night and all of a sudden Eno appears at the side of 
<laughs> of our little group as we're talking about a pop promo that he made where he interviewed himself as a different character oh. <laughs> uh, under the name something like Johnny Danger or something and in the interview he he's all there in a leather jacket and he keeps asking these questions to Eno and then answering for Eno and butting in and stuff and Eno's getting the real Eno's getting very angry and, <laughs> and um, you know he, he overheard our conversation came in and said oh Oh, yes, Johnny Danger. Yes, he was fun to play, you know. And so I whipped out my pop annual and said, oh, could you sign this, Brian? Do you remember doing this? And he said, oh, yes. Oh, I remember this guy. He slagged me off and then signed it in oh, silver pen and then he was away and that was it. So I've got a two Kev from Brian sort of scribble in, a, in an old pop annual from Eno's hand. And, and that's kind of how I wanted to meet him. I, he's he's too much of a sort of god to me to, uh, yeah. to have you know, embarrassed myself any further. So it was perfect. <laughs> so uh, kind of about that, um, you're in your own way, you know, you're a celebrity too in the music business. Do you get people coming up to you when you're out in public ever? No. <laughs> no? You, if they glad? know me, yeah. <laughs> uh, are, are you glad? Oh God, I wouldn't want to be a celebrity if you paid me. It would be horrendous. Can you imagine having to think about that sort of stuff? That's a lot out? of mental work. No, yeah. I think I've I've been recognised like twice, maybe ever. And, what was that like? Uh, you know, and that was probably in a record shop <laughs> or a club. You know, and <laughs> yeah. I was probably there to play anyway. You know? Well, how, it's how different because that... it's like it's not like your face is on every record. Yeah. No, I'm not a celebrity at all. I mean, I I don't have any problems or anything like that. It's right, it's, right. It's not even something I would even consider. It's uh, you know, there, there's a lot of. Um, you see a lot of stuff online and you kind of make big assumptions about people and what yeah. their life is and who they are and all that. And when you meet them in real life, they're, they're very, usually they're very, you know, sit down to earth and, definitely. Um, you know, they, they do every. You only see a tiny part of the person on online, unless they're one of those oversharers that just choose to <laughs> yeah. have breakfast on their Instagram, you know, <laughs> but I'm not like that. I'm, I don't really share very much about my family or my, you know, my private life online. Um, I, I share a lot of stuff about why I think people would be following me. Why are you, why are you following DJ food? You're probably, you want to see records, you want yeah. to hear music, maybe That's you want to see to some it. design, you want to see some cool stuff I found maybe in, you know, in the, in the, in the, you know, in the charity shop or something, you know, right. or, you know, I, I, I'm not going to start posting that picture to my kids. It's not really yeah, yeah. good business, I, you know? So I, why you, I don't want, I don't want to, you know, when, you know, when someone gets a cat who you follow and you're like, or you're really yeah. into their art or their music and they get a cat. And then you just see cat pictures forever. Oh, man. And I'm just, oh man. I, I had, a, I had <laughs> a kind of, I had an experience a few weeks ago. I think, I mean, I told you about this actually over the messages where I, I realized that I was just sharing too much on my Instagram and yeah. I don't know. There was something, I just had this realization. I was like, anyone could look at my Instagram and figure out a lot about my personal life. And I, I just didn't like the way that felt. So I, even, even down to where you live, you know, yeah, exactly. some people, it you was, know, I, I try not to share any pictures of where I live or yeah, not too yeah. close anyway, because there are people out there that will find that and they will go yeah. and knock on your door. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're not. Yeah. You're, and, you're I mean, absolutely right. You and, the, and the kind of person that's going to do that is going to be the kind of person you don't want to do that. Exactly, you know? yeah. So, um, but yeah, the, the, but I think we're all, when we have all been learning how to use social media over the last decade or more, you know, mm -hmm. it's, we, we've all overshared at some point and said stupid shit. And, you know, that's why people yeah. go back and delete their timelines and stuff like that. And, yeah. And, and I, I look at some of these people that share pictures of their kids from the moment they're born and I think, wow. What's your kid going to think of that when exactly. they're 18, 20 years old? Yeah, yeah, their whole life is online. It makes you think. I mean, yeah. I have a personal page where only my family and like, you know, like Caden are on there. And I share a lot of stuff on that one, but only because yeah, of course, most, of my, most of my family yeah. lives. Yeah, there's a fine Ireland, line actually. between, yeah. you know, there is. building a relationship with other people, staying connected. And yeah. then there's, and then there's saying too, too it's just too much. Yeah, it's just too so, much. Something I wanted to ask you was it's kind of a different you know direction here. What was some of the biggest challenges that you faced uh, as far as you know? I guess broad challenges, or you could even you know about your music or graphic design career. Uh, the biggest thing was probably when I left college. 
trying to break into graphic design. Yeah. Um, the, co- the course I was on at Camberwell in London was a really good course, but they didn't teach you the sort of practical side of once you've designed this thing or drawn this thing, how do you get it printed? Yeah. So I kind of had to learn in public with the jobs that I was doing. Um, I'd take stuff to a printer and they'd go, I can't print this because I don't have any of the <laughs> fonts or the, uh, you know, I, you know, you haven't done it to the right size and where are the crop marks and there's no bleed over the edge. So you're going to get a white line around everything. And I didn't know any of this because they didn't teach me that stuff at school. They just taught me how to think and how to, you know, solve a project. You know, they didn't talk, tell you how to mark artwork up for a printer. And, right. and convert RGB to CMYK and things like that. Um, so I had to kind of do my growing up and learning in public. And there's a lot of early ninja sleeves where they look terrible to me because I can <laughs> see all the mistakes and some of the mistakes are huge, you know, <laughs> right. or there's, there's, you know, how I wanted it to come out of my head and how it actually came out. If you wouldn't the mind, it was like all the colors are wrong. And, if you, you know. wouldn't mind, what, what's an example that we could take a look at? of a, 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 a sleeve that went really not great and then a sleeve that you're really, really proud of. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I did, an, I did an album. You're probably not going to be able to find it online that easily, but uh, I did an album called Trumpet Riffs, which was a sort of offshoot thing of, of Ninja, to- Ninja Tune. And the... The, the original color palette was something like a sort of electric light blue with a with a mauve. And when I got it back from the printers, it was a kind of aqua green and brown. <laughs> oh. because, because the colors on my computer screen were just so badly calibrated. They weren't calibrated at all. So what I was seeing on my cheap computer oh. was not what the printer was seeing, basically. Because I didn't have any color reference books or anything like that. And I didn't have any calibrated screens. And I would have, um, and I'd go in there and I wouldn't outline my fonts and things would have moved and letters would be missing sometimes. Oh, my God. And and all sorts of stuff where I'm just, I get it back (laughs) and I'm like, what? You know, what happened there? That was on the spine and now it's on the back. You know, know, screen fonts and printer fonts back in the 90s were very different beasts. And if you didn't have both printer and screen fonts, it it wouldn't work. Wow. I didn't know any of this, you know, but, uh, you know, in my defense, no one knew that stuff because it was the yeah. dawn of using computers as, as design tools, you know, and everyone's Definitely. kind of learning the hard way. I was, I was really learning in public and I didn't really have too many people because I got a computer just as I left college. So it, I only had my flatmates to kind of go, how do you do this? You know? Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that's an example of a terrible one. I mean, a good one, I don't know. Uh, the Recipe for Disaster cover by DJ Food was probably one of the first records I'm kind of, I was kind of pleased with how that turned out. It, right. it came back and it, it was all in the right place and it, the colors all matched and it was all, it was kind of good. I don't know if you remember that one. It's the yeah. knife and fork and there's like a pizza on a turntable. There's a little I, shot of it. That's a big great. red DJ Food down the side. I think that I've was, seen that, that one. That was kind of, kind I, of busy. But, I have that know. album downloaded on my phone. I think that's a good one. <laughs> you got the download. <laughs> I do. We were talking about this the other day about, you know, like um, you get these articles where you got, uh, you know, DJs and collectors sharing their collection. And you, you, you see some crazy room and it's like walled out with vinyl top to bottom. And you yeah. say, oh man, look at that guy's collection. And what's it going to be in 20, 30 years? Is it going to be a guy with a massive hard drive going, here's my collection. And then, <laughs> I, I have. Actually, I've got, <laughs> you know, and I've got X amount, million yeah. of songs and all that sort of stuff. That's a good, uh, yeah, that or it'll be all on the cloud, but I think there's something about having it in a hard drive or a vinyl. This uh, is 500 gigabytes yeah, right I mean, here. <laughs> I've got, exactly. I'm looking at two of my hard drives that one of them is filled with music. So I, it, yeah. it's kind of going that that's, way. That's, I've, uh, have you heard of the program SoulSeek? Yeah. yeah. I, yeah, that's what I've, I turned Tommy onto that a couple months ago. Just, is SoulSeek still going? I mean, that it was is. like, it that is really, really well. You can get on there. There's you can get on there. And it's actually relatively there. active. There's a little community where people. It's kind of crazy, yeah. actually. I went on there and Caden showed me. I mean, I used to use Napster, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, Napster and 
all yeah. that stuff. You know, back when it was all media fire and rapid share oh, and yeah. all that sort of stuff. <laughs> and you know? so I used to use that stuff, and then you know, it you know, I became I did more legal stuff for a while, and, but and then I got soul seek. And then I decided to look my stuff up. You know, I'm not very that big in the music scene. I mean, I, a couple of interviews, but not many people know about me. But all my music was on there, mm. and I was like on a like, Russian server somewhere, probably. Yeah, no, it was <laughs> that, and then a couple other just like random people. I was really surprised. You know, it just you means check it just out means your that stuff. Somebody your, downloaded. Yeah. Someone, because what what they ask in Soul Seek is when you, you sign up, file. you share all of your stuff. And you get access to everyone else's mm-hmm. stuff. So it's in a this, way, I was flattered. It's but. this arbitrage of <laughs> everyone's it, music collection. It's more of a surprise if something isn't on the internet. Yeah, yeah. that's true. You know, you, I don't know if you ever do that thing when you like Google something and you're like, "There's nothing here," and there's yeah. there might be a yeah. few mentions of the thing. Maybe it, maybe it's a track, but there's no actual audio. You must have spelled it wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Maybe. I know that feeling. It's it is kind of crazy that it's. There's just so much information out there. Wow. So here, what is... I just want to say, though, I'm not a digital purist, vinyl, analog, digital, you know, right, whatever right, right. you want to use. It's, it's all the same to me. I'm just, yeah. I've grown up in the analog, oh, vinyl, uh, you know, and cassette sort of era, but I'm just as into CDs and digital yeah. as anyone else. I've been digitally DJing since 2005. So, right. you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be some music snob on that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, we, we've talked to people who are on both ends of the spectrum and, you know, it's all the same to me. Yeah, some people want to listen to only vinyl. At least, it's, I mean, we haven't met anyone who only listens to reel to reels yet, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what do they do if they want to listen to a song and it's not on vinyl? What do they do? I think they just cry. Right. I mean, it just seems it seems crazy to sort of cut a whole section of your yeah. of that of that out of your life just because, you know. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, we're getting off topic. <laughs> Do you know the alphabet aerobics? Not word for word. Could you I give know it all your, the track, but I could you give I it your best it shot? No, no. <laughs> Until oh, What's Tommy it, thought you'd do it. He thought you could do it. I can't even do the first line. Hang on. I used to know the whole song. I'm not going to do it for, I'm no, it's been years. This article's amazing. Oh, no, I can't. I've lost it on the second one. <laughs> who's, it, who, who's it can do? The guy, the guy who played Harry, Harry Potter, Potter could do it, right? Daniel Rag. We Daniel just watched Rag. that right before this. Because, yeah. I, I mean, I used to know the entire lyrics in uh, mm. middle school or high school. And I was like, I, I wonder if he did. But yeah, can you can you rhyme it fast like get to gap? I used to be able to. I'm not gonna. I, no way in a million years would I ever do it publicly. Yeah. Come on, <laughs> did you? You're a sound psychologist, bro. Come on. What did you hear it? the follow up chemical calisthenics as well? What was it? Ke- chemical calisthenics, I think is how it's pronounced. I have not heard that one. That was oh. a follow up, and it was on the Blackalicious album, maybe Blazing Arrow. Is it? I think. I'll have to listen Blazing. to that one. Is it Blazing Arrow? Heard. Huh. I think I think you're right. Yeah, it's not quite as good, but they do the crazy speed up thing with the, like a train noise and stuff. It's really good. I'll have to check that one out. <laughs> and it's got chemist again as well doing the sort of production, so it's right. of a similar. But but that that whole idea of just A to G and speeding up is you know such a great genius. song, so iconic. Mm-hmm. So I've got another question. If you could put anything on a billboard, there's a billboard and there's yeah. a highway and you've got to put something on that billboard. What would you put on it? <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question, isn't it? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. Probably don't, don't look at this billboard or something. Don't stop now. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, a good one. If That's a good driving. One. Where would it? Where would it be in a highway, sort of like a, it, on a freeway or something? Yeah, yeah, everyone has to see it. Yeah, everyone yeah. has to look at it. Mil- yeah, millions. Well, of people. not. I mean, if they look, if they're looking at billboards, yours yeah, yeah. is the one that they're going to see. Okay, I don't know. Probably like look out with an exclamation mark or something. Very cool. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You you just throw that at me. It's, that's you could go really <laughs> deep on that, couldn't you? We, oh, we've, of we had someone who gave. Sat there and just like thought about it for like five minutes, and they had a really cool. Oh, really? Okay. 
But I mean, I, my one, I didn't. No, get much we don't thought. need. We're not trying to like probe no. you for some spiritually. We just yeah, think. Yeah. We just think it's interesting. We get some very different answers. You know. I heard a good thing the other day. What's the one thing you can't buy with money? What What is the one thing you can't buy with money? What's the one thing you can't buy with money? Love, love. Yeah, I'd say poverty. Pop. Oh, oh, <laughs> that's my more God. of a joke. It's a pretty poverty. good one. That's quite, that kind of deep, good, you know. That is a good one. You're not wrong. You can't. It's, it's kind of sad. That was one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, you could if you spent all your money on it. You could do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Did you hear about that guy? There was an English artist, and he, I forget his name, sadly. So um, it kind of didn't do him any good. But he 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 put his entire possessions in a in a grinder, like a trash compactor sort of thing, what? Uh, as a sort of art statement piece. Um, and he did it in public as well. He had a, a it had this sort of you know grinder machine and he would wow. slowly just like it was that like it was like big enough to take all of his possessions and grind them yeah yeah he would he would break stuff down and feed it into this grinder thing and and then wow. you know he took all it all his clothes all his possessions photos letters you name it everything he had and including right down to the clothes he was wearing in the end so he was naked um and then you know that was his art statement he was going to like destroy all his past and his life up until that point. Um, unfortunately, I think he had some sort of mental breakdown afterwards, which oh, you know, was unfortunate. Yeah. Really? Like yeah. was? Oh no! I can't remember his name though, which was kind of you know you'd you'd hope that if you were going to do an art art thing, yeah, you'd be remembered. You'd remember who it was, like the KLF burning a million pounds and things like yeah. that. Yeah, you, know, you kind of know that. Wow, that's extreme. What yeah. do you think about like what if you did that? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, you have these scenarios in your head, like what if, I, if, if my house burned down and everything it, I owned in it was just gone and there was no way that's, you know, that's out of your control to actually yeah. go through that and do it willfully. That would be pretty, pretty seriously messed up. I think um, yeah. there's that whole idea of having a fresh start. That's sometimes kind of appealing, but you, I and think you have, a, you have a family. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't want to lose certain aspects of, you know, my family that, I've, that I'm attached yeah. to. You know, obviously not the people as well. You know, but <laughs> yeah. Pop, pop them in the grinder. You know, <laughs> you know, your, your, children, your children make you cards and, and give you presents yeah. and stuff. And, you know, that's worth more than anything. Well, the, you know, the that is one of the hardest things as a parent is when your kid likes to draw and you have like 300 papers and you're like, well, because <laughs> you have to decide I'm going to keep all of them. Or, yeah, none, or yeah. like maybe, you know, one or two. No, it's worth it though, because I was going through some posters last week and I had some ninja posters in a roll and I unrolled it. And in the poster roll was this huge picture of some angry birds that my kids had drawn when they were That's about cute. five. And I said, oh, kids, look at this. And they're like, wow, you've got that. Oh, you know, That's you cool. Know. Yeah, we hold you on know, to all of ours. That sort of nostalgia hit, you can't replace that. Definitely. So in what ways would you say having kids and starting a family has influenced your music and creative life? Mm. Not necessarily influenced the creative life. It's made me have to use my time a lot yeah. more seriously. Definitely. You know, you, you don't have the, the hours in the day to maybe go at that project 110% like you used to, which is unfortunate. I mean, I do. I have, I have time now. My kids are 16, right. so. You know, that's not a problem as much as it was when they were six. But, you know, um, I wouldn't say too much of that's impacted into my music. You know, I haven't started recording them doing vocals for a track right. or anything like that. Well, I mean, as a, I mean, I have a daughter actually, and this is a personal question. What advice would you have for managing? I mean, I've had this, I have this issue where I've got my studio. I haven't really worked in there in weeks just because time management what advice would you have as far as how to do that how old is your daughter she's she's two just turned two okay i would say the studio can wait but your yeah. daughter can't yeah and your daughter will grow up incredibly quickly um and you in a blink of an eye it'll be 10 years and you'll go wow what was i doing was i in the studio or i was with my daughter and you won't want to miss that time you you can you can do the studio anytime i mean it's 
personally for me when I had my kids I'm like right okay I'm stopping you know it's them now first and obviously as they get older that eases a little but I you know you can't bring another life into this world and and just be number one they they have to be number one you know 100% Um, as far as I'm concerned personally you know and my kids are 16 and it seemed like yesterday that we were taking them you know out of the hospital wow yeah you know sound like a very good dad just to let you know so <laughs> of course uh, it would have been great if you lifted your mug up and it said you know number, best, number best one dad, dad. Yeah, number one dad. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're actually almost out of time but okay. um a couple little questions here i wanted to ask you one piece of advice two two this is a two-part question what's the best piece of advice you've been given and what advice would you give other people or a younger version of yourself? I think we asked you this last time and, and we stumped you. And I asked you this question years Shit. ago in our first interview that I was running for a record label. Really? Oh, that's interesting. I what did, did I say I, then? I'll tell you after you give me your... You tell me after. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so what's the first one? What's the best piece of advice I've ever been given? Yeah. The one that immediately jump, jump, um, jumps to mind is... Um, by all means copy, but do it your own way. That's because good. when I was in art school, this whole thing was jumped into our head, drummed into our head, like, you know, you've got to be original. You've got to, you know, find your voice and all this sort of stuff. And if you take that very literally, you, it means don't copy anyone else and try right. to have your own ideas that no one else has done. And of course, everyone's done everything in some way or time. Yeah. And, this teacher said to me once, a new a new teacher, I was kind of struggling on my course, and he said, you know, don't worry about copying, but just do it in your own way. Don't don't literally copy them. You know, right. take their idea and do your version. And it was almost like a floodgate opened, and yeah. it was like permission to copy suddenly um, from this one tutor. So that I always remember that, and that was that was Graham Wood, who is a designer who works with Tomato, who, who, who was design that? practice over here, but design for underworld and people like that. What was the name um, of the guy? Graham Wood. Graham Wood. Graham. Graham. Yeah. Okay. Um, Graham. And he, yeah, he, I, I, you know, he really, he almost, he, he gave me permission um, to see things in a different way. And another, another tutor who, I mean, this wasn't really advice. He, right. you know, I, I was thinking about going to art college and, I said to my tutor, I don't, I don't think I'll get in there. And he looked at my work and he said, I think you will. And that was enough. That was all I needed. And yeah. sometimes it just needs that one, you know, encouraging phrase in a, at a particular juncture of your, you know, education or something by yeah. one teacher. You may not even be that close to those people, but, right. yeah. you know, you listen to those people. And, and, and if they, if someone else is telling you, you can do it, you can do it. And also... Conversely, if someone asks you to do something and you think you can't do it, they think you can do it, so you should try. You know, if someone's coming to you and you're going, can you play in front of 2,000 people? And you've never done that before. And you're like, uh, I'm not ready. They think you're ready. Yeah. So, you know, go and prove them right. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and take that chance and, you know, just jump in to the deep end. Sometimes you've got to jump in the deep end and, this is me telling you that the advice, sometimes you've got to jump in the deep end. Uh, right. If someone gives you the uh, opportunity, because that's, that's whether you think you can advice. do it or not, what's the worst can happen? It's going to be, you're going to fail or you're going to sail. Yeah. So what you said last time was don't be an asshole. Oh really? Yeah, that's a good that one. Was. And actually after that interview, my dad, my dad is a huge DJ food fan. Like, Right. In, he introduced me to a he he sat in the corner of the room the whole time and listened. And okay. that that was pretty great. I was living at home then. And afterwards, he he sends me that message all the time like, "Remember what DJ Food told you, don't be an asshole whenever I'm doing <laughs> anything important." He goes, "Don't don't forget that." So, yeah. well, I know I know what that means. That's that's yeah. basically a condensed version of treat people as you expect to be treated. And it doesn't matter who they are, whether they're the boss or whether they're the guy cleaning the floor, because yeah. in 20 years time, the guy cleaning the floor is going to be the boss. Mm-hmm. And you might still, you know, they might have 
gone way past you on the social ladder. And I still meet people, you know, today that, you know, I met back in the day and, right. you know, they, and they were, they were kind of way down the ladder and they just was way past. And you've got, you know, if you, if you were an arsehole to them back in the day, they're going to remember it. That's pretty much exactly how you explained it back yeah. then as well. So, <laughs> well, hey, it, we're, we are out. This has been an hour with DJ Food. So we're going to probably go ahead and wrap this up. It flies by, doesn't it? It does when you're having fun. It does. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Loads so, of fun. So, I mean, you know, thank you so much for coming on here for the third time, actually. <laughs> no worries. No worries. But it's um, this one has been recorded for sure. And cool. we're really glad to have you on. It was a blast. We'll have to talk again soon. Yeah, um, nice. yeah this was episode five of KT Music, a conversation with. This was a conversation with DJ Food, Kevin, folks. So thanks for tuning in. We will see you guys next Thursday. Peace. Yeah.